We're joined now by a very familiar face and probably more so voice uh, to rugby fans all over the country, Liam Tolan. Liam, thanks very much for joining us. How are you? I'm as good as gold, Duncan. Thanks for having me. Tori, uh, I have a couple of questions. Thanks for coming on, first of all, and, uh, and supporting this great initiative. But um, we're, 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 everyone that we're getting on here, we're chatting to them, and this is a crazy time with COVID. And I'm not sure if, I'm sure most people know that you're one of the vainest men in, in, on the country. So how have you been managing getting through quarantine now? Your hair is still looking pretty good there. Uh, you don't seem to put on a noticeable weight that I can see from the breast level up. So, For a start, could you come around? I, I need a neck shave. I remember when I was a cadet back in the day, every morning we used to have to shave our necks. I've got this fuzzy amount of hair coming off the back of my neck. I can, I can cover everything else, but that's what's catching me out. So it's been a, it's been a weird time. And I tell you one thing, the, the increase of the five kilometers will be very helpful because I'm going cycling, uh, which is an ideal sport for us retired guys because uh, knees and hips and shoulders. Uh, so it's been beautiful. The weather has been very helpful. But I think from my point of view, I've disciplined myself to get out and cycle the bike because otherwise the cocooning thing, we're working away all the time. And it would just, it, I, I'd find it too hard. So I, the weather has been brilliant and cycling has been absolutely brilliant as well. Tony, totally. um, uh, you, you don't have you haven't been selected on either of the teams here, and you're not a coach either. Um, but Katie, Katie McCluskey, who's organised this with us, has said that that you want to get on and talk about some of the charity work that you're doing yourself uh, on behalf of the Mid Midwest Simon community. So, while you while you talk yourself up there and tell us a little bit about the uh, the, the Simon community and the good work that you're doing with them there. Yeah, well, uh, just in the interest of accuracy, uh, I'm, I'm a... Don't worry player. about the accuracy. Don't worry about the accuracy. Okay, this hasn't been recorded or anything, no. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, thankfully that. But uh, I'm, I'm just a member of the board. So it's Jackie and her team that, I suppose, never waste a crisis is a good starting point. And uh, it's been wonderful to watch Jackie and her team in the middle of this crisis because their can-do attitude was always there but it's very much come to the fore now and it's, it's, it's very impressive. And when you link that with their non-judgmental approach to what, what Midwest Sign are doing within the community, it's very impressive. And uh, most charities are struggling for obvious reasons. Funding is down and this month we will be having our annual ball. Now, I think it's a celebration, but when you link a charity with a ball and a celebration, you kind of say, hang on a second, you're out. what are you celebrating homelessness? But I think celebrating the great work that's been done by the team and the amazing impacts making within the community. But the obvious negative to not having the ball is the fundraising is down, um, the awareness of what, what uh, Jack and her team is down is that the shop has been closed, the donations around the bucket collecting has been closed. But the most recent, and this what makes it so local, Jerry, the most recent um, event I was involved was the sleep out in Coleman Park, uh, um, which was an amazing experience. A lot of Shannon guys, a lot of Munster guys involved, and just random people from the community who wanted part. But one of my roles that night was to interview a number of the, number of the end users. Um, and uh, I sat down not knowing what the tone should be, because here I am, a silver spoon to my mouth, very, very fortunate life. You know, all the, you know, great family, great, primarily great parents, great family, great home life. And the rest was up to me, but that foundation was phenomenally advantageous to me. But I met with a number, I tried to figure out the tone. But I was talking to one guy who's now similar age to me, a little younger, um, and he'd been through an extraordinary journey that would just blow the socks off you. So I tried to bring it back low. And I said, look, where were you in school? So his dad was, um, was in the army, so he was based in Sars School Barracks. So as a result of that, he was in the model school. Okay. And I said, okay, well, right. And what's that like? Uh, and he started talking about life in the model. And I said, all right, that's very interesting. We're interested in sport. And he says, oh, well, sure. I was sitting beside Jerry Flannery. Huh? So this guy, who, like you have got Grand Slams, Heineken Cups, all the bells and whistles of your journey, but at one point in time, you actually sat beside this guy. Right? I won't tell you his name, but I was blown away by that. I was like, what? And then he started telling his story. And if you kind of paralleled your journey to his and how it started to diverge very quickly. So his parents fell into hard times. He moved school. He went up a different school. A lot of his dreams and ambitions were taken from him. So he just told his story and he ended up on the street. And during that journey, all the horror, and he started filling us in and I was just blown away by this guy. And I couldn't get my mind, you out of my mind in this, right? 
So he went and he, we spoke for maybe a half an hour. But what it did, it told me, so confirmed something, how lucky I am, obviously. And I'm not saying that from a, oh, look at me. I'm just saying the simple things that I took for granted, stuff like great parents, great family, great home, good schooling, sporting connections around, gave me such an advantage. And when they start to erode away from you, how you become vulnerable, and this guy did. The second thing I noticed about this guy was how easy it is to help him because he's grateful for the new fresh start. And this guy's had a hundred fresh starts, but he was there with his girlfriend who also went through a similar journey. They have an apartment just off Catherine Street, which has been supplied by Jackie and her team and the community essentially. And this guy, I've met him on the street several times and he's just a wonderful, decent guy, really decent fella. And he fell into hard times and you sat beside him whatever, 30 years ago. And it's just an extraordinary example of the work that Midwest Simon are doing within the community to people who come from the community. And we could be sitting beside the guy who you meet on the street. And that's as simple as it is. So from what I do, I'm just, a, you know, I'm just on the board, but Jackie and her team, uh, there's, it's especially challenging at the moment, lack of funds. Um, and the food bank as an example, right? So the food bank does this feed, it's an acronym, F-E-A-D. It's uh, fun for European aid to most deprived. So there's pallets of food, ordinary food comes in every couple of weeks and is distributed in Nina, Ennis and Limerick. Um, really difficult because of all the logistics of distributing it. But the numbers have gone from about 7,000 to 8,000. So there's a thousand new sets of people because of COVID that need to queue up in a line to get food. And that's all from within the community. So that's kind of why I'm involved in it. It's a community-based concept, um, very simple great can-do attitude um, and it's really given back and it's, it's a pleasure to be part of it to be honest especially because of the can-do attitude and liam uh, what, what 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 can they do now with with with, with covid coming in how, how can they raise funds or how can people contribute to this 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 uh, this charity now yeah, well there's a funds issue and then there's an awareness issue and i thank a lot of the the monster guys on the foot in the door uh, campaign which is literally going up to your front door open and going inside and the, the concept of imagine if you didn't have a front door so the, the awareness aspect is important and the connecting that to the local journey that that the community are going through there is a telephone number uh 061 608 980 which is the speaker's corner for those from limerick uh, Speaker's Corner is a famous place there, it's a beautiful spot and there's where you've got a lot of drop-in people coming in, but it's a good place to start. Uh, if you are someone who is vulnerable, it's a great number to call. If you're somebody who wants to give back, it's a great place to start the journey too. And would you believe in the age of, um, of social media, an awful lot of the vulnerable people themselves are contacting through Facebook. So Facebook is a good place if you're vulnerable too to get involved or just get online as well. But that telephone number is a good place to start the journey and it's very local, it's a community based. And like another thing that's happening in cocooning is that vulnerable over 70s who find themselves homeless, Midwest are supporting them in a cocooned way as well. So like life goes on, life gets in the way of our plans, isn't it? Mm. Um, and so it would be really helpful if people became aware of, of the stories and became aware of what they could do and just simply support as best they can. That'd be brilliant. And, and Dunk, if I'm correct, you, were, you, you acted as an ambassador for the, for the Simon community there for a good few years until you actually had to go move, moved away with rugby to France, correct? That's right, yeah. So I know firsthand um, the, the wonderful work that Liam is talking about that Jackie and her team doing there. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's really poignant to hear him uh, tell that story because ultimately, uh, I think as Liam says, people don't realise just how kind of close to our own situations uh, a lot of people started out in life and then just just through bad luck and bad circumstances, they, they end up going on very different paths. And like that's, I, I think that's really powerful. The fact that th this uh, gentleman in question was actually sitting next to you in the model school and you know, for all intents and purposes, anyone looking in at that classroom would have just seen two regular young fellas sitting next to one another. But um, unfortunately, as Liam says, um, like life just throws things at you that are that aren't the fault of um, any any individual that that has to suffer the consequences of it. Particularly a, a child like that who, you know, has to move school, um, parents fall on hard times, that kind of stuff. It's all out of out of their control, but it has a hugely adverse effect on their opportunities to go and uh, fulfill their potential in life and that's why organizations like Midwest Simon are, are so crucial because um, they provide such such an important service uh, at, at the coalface really 
Um, so I, I'm delighted to hear that um, Liam has, has uh, been involved with them and is, is doing really important work to help them spread the message and to raise funds. Um, I was reading something the other day that said I think charities are expecting a, a 60% drop in funding for the calendar year of 2020. So you can imagine an organization that's almost entirely reliant on donations, um, like a lot of the homelessness charities are, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to continue to provide the services that are needed uh, to an ever increasing number of vulnerable people. So um, that's why it's very important that if people can, that uh, they, they contribute and, and even if it's just something like raising awareness so that the message is being spread, uh, that will make all the difference. Uh, so, so well done, Liam, and, uh, and obviously, as always, well done to everyone involved with Midwest Simon. Um, just moving on to rugby, Liam, because uh, obviously, as we've mentioned before, you're, you're a well-known face and voice when it comes to analysing teams. Uh, so what are your own thoughts? We, we'll talk about the back row maybe initially, uh, that matchup that we spoke about prior to you, uh, or pr prior to us starting to record there. What are your thoughts there? Um, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing two back rows. I have it here in front of me on the screen. Um, I suppose the most successful of all of the open sides would be David Wallace for all the obvious reasons. But for me, Eddie Halby, I had the pleasure or displeasure of playing with and against Eddie, uh, David, um, and Ger Earls, and Ger Earls at his pomp. And like I was competing for a place against the, in that competition. Of course, I was particularly frustrated when I didn't get picked, and I got picked sometimes. I got dropped a lot of times. But in hindsight, when you look at Eddie Halby, for me was pound for pound probably one of the best rugby players that Ireland has ever produced. He was just at the time, of course, I didn't give him this credit, but in reflection, I do. He was absolutely fantastic. Um, Gerald's in his pomp, um, he played for Young Monsters and I was playing for Old Crescent. So it was basically the average age of Old Crescent was about 14 and the average age of Young Monsters was about 40. So we used to get killed. So it was always a serious battle. But I'll tell you a little story about Gerald's. I was playing, uh, it would have been in, in the Killen Fields and he was open side, I was open side. Like Gerald was a super, super player, a super player, right? And uh, whoever our scrum half presented the ball to scrum and Gerald Earls tapped the ball out of his hand and into their side. So they would have had Paco and Shaw and whatever else, and Fitzy as the front row. And of course, my instinct jumped up, get up into a massive fight, and I got killed, of course, because, you know, I'm playing with children against men. And, but like, that's what you do, isn't it? You know, you just get out of it. So I said, right, that's never going to happen to me again. This was back in maybe 1993, 92 or something like that, right? So fast forward anyway. <clears throat> And I was captain of Leinster in, uh, we played Leicester back to back, home and away. We beat them at home in the, in the pool stages. And the last game of the pool was away and we beat them away as well, which is pretty cool. And Neil Back was the open side for, um, for Leicester. So we were in, uh, in Leicester playing and Aston Healy presented the ball to the scrum. And I said, ah, hang on a second here. And I tapped the ball out of Aston Healy's hands, right? Now, this... Uh, Neil Back was unfamiliar with the local Limerick dynamic or you, you immediately fight at this stage. So he kind of grumbled with his own fight. And then fast forward a couple of seasons later when Munster played Leicester in Cardiff in the European Cup final and the Neil Back hand of Back came into play. I, were you playing that, Jerry? No. Was, you we, won, we, we, we won the games that I, that I played in the final. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he went in and all hell broke loose, obviously, right? So you can trace the Neil Back hand of back back to Ger Earls, whose son Keith Earls would have been involved in around that time as well. I have often giggled. I learned that from Ger. I did it to Neil Back, who subsequently went back to, to Monster to do it. So I always thought that there was a little bit of a, a story in that. I would I would and never blame Ger Earls for that. I'm blaming you because if you had been if you had the cop on to just leave it, like you don't mess with Ger Earls, <laughs> if you should have just left it, then Munster might have another European Cup. That is fair, that is fair. But he 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 learned me well to use proper English. He learned me well. But I would say going back to the, the like um it's it's a kind of a looking at the back rows, my initial reaction is Peter Amani. Mick always picked Peter Amani at blind side winger and number eleven. Is that a nod towards Jonah Lomu in the World Cup in 95 when Richie Wallace had to face this guy who no one heard of called Jonah Lomu? They played off. So that would be worth the, if this was a real match, that would be worth seeing. How would Richard Wallace react to uh, Peter Amani in the, in, the, in the guise of that? 
but uh, it's a kind of a Leinster, the, the, the back line that McGawie picked, I would favour over the uh, Donald Lennon back line, certainly. Mm. The, front row, the front five of McGawie's looks like a Leinster side. Um, so it's an intriguing, it's an intriguing uh, matchup. But the back rows, gee, the Sean O'Brien, Dennis Leamy and Halby with, uh, with uh, Quinlan, Foley and Wallace. Like they're top six, they're quality, quality players. It's, uh, it's, it would be wonderful to watch. But again, for me, Eddie Halby is, um, he was some player. He was yeah, some player. a phenomenal talent. It'd be interesting to see if, if Sean O'Brien and Leamy could actually function with him or would they just eventually, would he just drive them crazy? <laughs> Well, you would argue the same case on the flip side with Foley and Wallace and Quinlan. I know they have, but uh, how much uh, how much catering would they have to do with Alan Quinlan? The same with Eddie Halvey. These these are characters that uh, have lit up our game, and obviously uh, Alan Quinlan himself is like I, I played the day he played his first game for Munster was against Samoa, and I was playing that day. I hadn't really known him. Um, like I'd have been twenty, he'd have been in around that. So we're two young guys playing, and I was blown away by this guy, Alan Quinlan. Like he was just very raw, but he was, even at that age, he was pure quality. Like, he was a quality player, amazing athlete as well. So, like, that was the environment that, if you think of poor old Gerrards, who unfortunately didn't get picked for Ireland, and in my mind, I played against him. He was certainly more than, like, he should have played for Ireland. He didn't. But you've got to look back at the competition in Munster at the time. It was pretty, you know, world-class stuff. Like, really was, in fairness. So, so boiling it down then, if you were to, to call it, which, which side do you think would win if they played, if they were to play each other? I think the Ireland selection by Mick Galway will win that particular game. But I think Mick Galway, knowing he was probably picked on the Limerick team, has definitely picked what he perceives as weaknesses in the side he picked for <laughs> Ireland. So he'd know he, he's, he's favoured his other selection and that would be classic Mick Galway. Like if he was... <laughs> If he was in an Irish trial or something, he would try and manipulate the opposition team in a way to give him the best, which is quality Mick Galway politics. Like, what is he? <laughs> Nearly 50 caps for Ireland in a Lions tour and an All-Ireland medal. He didn't get there on just uh, his talent. He got there on his ability to know and to pick inside. So there's no doubt he's put subtle weaknesses into that side he's picked in order for him to win. And who, who would you be able to pick out as the subtle weaknesses there? Which players would you say are, would be the weakest? I think, I think, considering the audience, anyone who's played for Leinster would be... Oh, oh, very good, very good. Considering very the good. audience, right? <laughs> considering the audience. Uh, all right, Liam. Um, thanks very much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, well done again on the work you're doing with Midwest Simon. And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. And, and uh, keep safe throughout the rest of... Um, the bizarre circumstances that we find ourselves in now and take care. And I would also say thank you guys as well and for Katie and the team who've organised this. It's a great initiative. It really is a great initiative and, and well done to you and well done to Katie and to all the people who are involved in Foam Park, etc. So thank you very much for the opportunity.